Hello, everybody, and welcome to my very 13th episode of A Very Special Guest. Uh, special Guest, who the heck are you? Oh my god, my name is E, but I'm like officially called E is social online, so I go by both. <laughs> is E social? That's the big question. Um, no, not really. I don't really okay. leave my house. But oh. somewhere in this universe, in some multiverse, I am very social, I believe. In the multiverse of Enos? I think so. Yeah, we got a whole MCU going. Yeah, <laughs> An ECU. Me, as we're talking, I'm going to be... There we go. I hope this is crisper. I just moved my microphone in front Ooh. of me. Ooh, I it know, is a little crisper. So the thing that I do, right? I mm -hmm. um, I bought like a microphone phone booth thing because I can't... Because I'm in a college dorm, so I can't soundproof a college dorm, you know? Um, yeah. So I have a little mini booth that does it for me, which is nice. That's good. I, I'm just in a room oh, wow so yeah Crazy. i want to get some soundproofing stuff because sometimes i listen back to my recordings and i'm like oh girl that's an echo yeah uh, but i have to just like let it be because it's not that bad so i think audio is like the hardest part of the video making process right like because you gotta get oh, it right God. yeah it used to drive me crazy before i got this mic which kind of mic you use oh um i use a, sh a sure S H U R E. Don't ask me the numbers though, because I don't. I'm not good with numbers. No worries. So, it's a sure. It's not the big XLR. XLR. It's not yeah, like the XLR. big boy. Yeah, XLR one, but it's like a USB one, which it works pretty great with me. I love my sure. That so. is. Are you sure you love your sure? Okay, I'm sorry. I had. To, I'm I, 99. I, <laughs> 99 percent sure. It was a bad pun opportunity. I hope you can excuse me there. Um, I would be mad at you if you didn't if you didn't make it. Exactly. No, exactly. <laughs> no, but like the whole thing for me, I am still on my like blue Yeti like um, microphone mm. that I got in like, maybe I got it in like, was it, it was probably freshman year or, or f yeah, freshman year-ish of like, or no, senior year of high, of high school probably, yeah. Um, this thing is kind of a piece of garbage at this point, but you know, it, it does what it does. I'm proud of Bro, him. Bro, don't fix it. Yeah. yeah. He sounds great. Thank you. No, it's... Uh, well, it's so funny with these microphones because they're kind of, like, bulky, right? And I take it wherever I can. So it's, like, I... I... I boarded it in, like, my backpack to get it to Ireland while it was, like, doing stuff... Uh, having my semester mm -hmm. there so i like you had my good little microphone boy brought over to uh, across continents with me so this one's seen battles you know um yeah it's got a history with you yeah except for the one semester that um my first semester of college my brother was like yo can i use that and i'm and i was like sure um haha -ha, don't think i'll need it um no my audio quality was awful that whole semester um but mm. But, you know, it does a good job. I'm proud of it. Yeah, you live and learn, I guess. Yeah. And if it's not broke, yeah, keep it. Sounds good. Exactly. Yeah. I, feel, I feel like we have that compulsive urge as, like, creators and people who, like, work in art and trying to constantly get the best stuff. When it's, like, yeah. I feel like working with, like, equipment that doesn't work for us is part of the whole artist online experience. It really is. It's I feel like the whole stacking your camera on a on a whole pile of books and trying to soundproof your room as much as you as possible with your crappy microphone is that's certainly where i started off from and it's it's humbling and it's uh oh, yeah. it's part of the it's part of the growth so it's well, nice one of the funnier ones right is when you take mm -hmm. a blanket right over your microphone stand yes, and, <laughs> yes. It's, and it's it's so weird because it's like you can't have your script right in front of you when you're doing that so you're mm -hmm. just kind of like scrolling your phone like a little goblin and being like, well, you see, this movie was received very well. No. Um, <laughs> or, um, no, I, I feel you. Yeah, no. Um, honestly, though, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you again so much for having me. No problem. Yeah, yes. no. I discovered you from the whole like fandom policing video because, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, people try to fandom police everything. Yes, and I'll tell you, the reaction to the video has been, I'd say, like, 95% really positive. Yeah. But that 5% vocal, very, yeah. very vocal on the Twitter sphere about how much they dislike the video. And <laughs> that was, um, you know, I wanted those, you know, the people that I was, you know, pretty much talking about being like, hey, you know, maybe leave people alone. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted them to, to watch it. And they did. And they made sure that I knew that they did. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I guess I will be real. That whole, like, it was a whole weekend where several, I'd say two tweets, threads about how either they don't want to watch the video because they already judged it based on what they thought it was going to be, which was like the right. whole point of the video was, hey, don't maybe don't do that until you actually, yeah. you know, educate yourself. Another one was a whole thread on what every single thing wrong with the video. <laughs> and yeah, it got like each tweet got like hundreds of thousands of views, you know. Oh my and gosh. The reactions to both either people being like, hey, maybe actually watch the video or like, did we even watch the same video? You know, and then a bunch of other people being like, yeah. Oh, the most infuriating was looking at those replies, which I shouldn't have done, you know, right. but people being like, um, oh, this person makes Genshin Impact content, so immediately their opinion is terrible. <laughs> like, okay, that's, it's so infuriating, because it's like, girl, I'm trying to have a discussion, and this, this is not good formula for a discussion. And that was quite the time, I will say. It was quite the time, but... Yeah, I don't yeah. think the online world will ever actually grow up, In to be honest within it, you know? It's, it's always been bad. It's just every single thing within like the discussions that emerge are like, mm -hmm. oh, this thing's like wrong and stuff, and it's like, and it's ma it's always Twitter. When people complain about the online world nowadays, most of it's Twitter. I feel like Twitter, like, it is. um, has I I I use the website, you know, but it's like I think mm. it's cultivated one of the worst user bases. Um, really, for sure, yeah. Because I don't know. Who thought is that, like, the guys who came up with Twitter, like, they thought that was such a genius idea to have, like, that character limit, when no, it, it, it literally destroys the nuance of any discussion. And it, and especially now in Elon Musk's Twitter age, everybody's oh. just kind of doing stuff just to get engagement so they can yeah. get, like, money. So, like, I feel like the, the stupid meme gimmick accounts are so all over the place, and then... Uh, just people just having the most rancid, terrible takes on the planet just to, like, rage bait people. Yeah. Just so they can get more engagement. And it's just, like, the app and the community was already pretty much bad. And now it's just gotten, like, worse. And if that was even possible. Well, and it is. <laughs> Apparently it is. So. so, one of the things, like, the whole thing with Twitter, right? They've, like, made some of the worst, like, dis business decisions ever, right? Like, Ugh. okay. They got rid of Twitter Circles, which was one of the few really good circle the features about Twitter, I'm right? Like, why? I don't get it. They got so they got rid of that. Then what they did. Then another thing is it's like I don't know. One of my one of the big things for me when I ever see it. You you you've been seeing Grok on your Twitter app. Yes. So Grok get Grok today. I don't I, think I will, sir. I have no idea why it's trying to peddle an AI service in a Twitter app, right? Let alone putting it the middle button out of your my five, you know? So it's like I'm bound to press it sometimes. Yeah, it's just the whole... I don't know if the app will ever fall apart, really, because I don't think... I think it's, you know... I don't think that's possible for it to, like, really fall apart. But for right. it to have, like, the downfall, like, a la Tumblr, uh, could be possible, I think. Yeah be possible oh, to and oh, maybe yeah. for the best but the thing is the reason why i'm so mad because i don't want it to fall apart is because there's a lot of people who make their livings like especially like artists off mm -hmm. of twitter and it makes me when elon musk was taking it and like ruining it i was so distressed for those few months because i was so worried for like the artists that i support and that i love and i was worried about them and other people who make their lives off of this app like Elon Musk is treating it and the higher ups are treating it like it's like their plaything. And it's like yeah. people's lives are dependent on this. And yeah, I I make connections. It's a part of, you know, my time as a person online to to use Twitter in that way. Stop messing with people's livelihoods, man. It's not cool. It's not okay. Well So Well it's kind of wild when you think about how Elon Musk of all people like got Twitter, right? Like that's that's one of the weirdest like that's one of the weirdest outcomes for the site ever, right? And how nothing has really been done with it. Um, and every business decision that app comes up with, it is without a doubt worse than the last one. Like, I still have no idea why he renamed it to X. Oh. Because, like, the, the brand already was brilliant, you know? Yeah, Twitter, a place to tweet a verb, you know? Yes. Like, it was so excellent and then what am i gonna do i'm gonna go x what does that yeah. mean yeah no i'm, I'm gonna, gonna, go gonna post on x you know 
Yeah. Oh, can you follow my ex? Oh, please be serious. I will never be referring to it as ex. Oh, and, please be so serious. And no one has. And it's like one of the worst. I think it's one of the worst branding nightmares I've ever seen a company come into. And it's like, cause yeah. it's like you got rid of this beautiful bird, right? Like that one of the things mm-hmm. about Twitter, right? Um, the bird's iconic. It's it's just a little guy. You can't you, nothing wrong to say about that little little dude, but yeah. And just for it to be gone, the oh gosh, and the colors went from like blue and white to like black and white. I it's just it's just <laughs> like I don't know the thought process, and I never will. And then I think I understand why he took away Twitter circles because I think I saw this with my own friend group, you know, people who gave me their Twitter circle. I never use Twitter circles because I don't know, I don't really have that much shit to say. Right. But um if uh but when they when they were taking away Twitter circles, everybody just made a separate account but made it private. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of people made extra accounts, which I think boosted, you know, money yeah. for the the company overall, which I think is what the play was, but still ridiculous the end it's so ridiculous i it's just beyond me within like what that app is because it's like i barely use it as is like i use it to reply to content creators that i like right Mm -hmm. or like am friends with or in those bubbles and then dm with people because twitter dm's actually pretty cozy i'm not gonna lie um one of the one of the better like instant messaging like things like it's it's so weird right because it's like instagram and like twitter I don't really use the, like, the messaging side, I feel like, is more chill than, like, most of those apps. Social media is just our giant messaging sites, right? It's... They really are. That's a good point. And that, it's... And though, this is one of my other frustrations here with this site, right? Whenever you, whenever you, like, make a post saying that you need any kind of art, the, there's a bunch of, like, art bots that just immediately swarm you trying to look for commissions. Yeah, that happened to me once. I I mistakenly said I need to get new overlays because I, you know, I went from curly hair to uh, dyed curly hair, short curly hair now. Ooh. So I, like I wanted to change like my emotes and Whoa. stuff. And uh, I know what a huge change, but it was you know a pretty big change. I wanted to you yeah. know update some stuff and and oh, I was flooded. All my mentions were flooded with people and all my. Um, DMs were flooded and people were even like flooding me on Discord. Like they went as far to find me on Discord. Hmm. I had to delete the tweet because I was like, "Oh God, this is so overwhelming. Who are you people?" You right. Know? Like, so I mean, I get it. I get the hustle, and I get that these people, um, when you're looking for work, they kind of, uh, you know, inspect the the tags and the keywords for people who are looking for work, like how yep. I was. But it, I just don't think it's a good tactic to start, you know, like yelling. At uh, at the person who could be, you know, potentially buying your services, it could be quite overwhelming. Well, which is too bad. And my bet is that ninety percent of those are bots too, which is the yeah. crazy thing because it's like, and I've noticed it because there's this trend happens on Discord sometimes too, right? Where you'll get a random hi from someone that you like don't know, right, on a server. Um, and yeah. it's like you start talking with them and they're like, um, I'm really low on money and I need commissions. Can you please let me come? Can you please commission me? No. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know you and I'm not looking for anything. I know I had yeah. to block someone because they kept they kept pushing. Oh, no. it's constant. It happens on streams, too, and stuff. It's, it's such a thing no. and stuff, too. And it's like and it's 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 crazy i it's buck wild what like people will do to try to get commissions within the it's like the thing about commissioning is it's like people go to you needing your services it's not it's it's not about like blind solicitation being like um you want you want to buy some art for me and it's like no absolutely not yeah yeah especially when you could tell it's a bot it's like ah no but i still feel bad <laughs> i still feel bad i'm like no maybe i should but i don't have any money <laughs> no i can't i'm so sorry exactly but uh, i am a college yeah. student so it's like <laughs> no money is kind of the whole shtick and you're you're a covering college student by the way i hope you get better yeah. soon um <laughs> thank you um i hope you start the healing process as well it's the debt is insane always for college students um, it, mm, it's bad it's it it's like Okay, you just got a degree four years here. Woo! Now we owe, owe everyone a lot of money. And I was like, great, just what I wanted to start my young adult life with. Um, oh, especially nowadays with this economy, you oh, yeah. know, like it's like the hardest time ever to find a job, and so now it's like, okay, I got student loans, and people are fresh out of college looking for a job, and no one's hiring. So but it's the, like 
Mm. But at the same time, parents are convinced that you can get a job. Oh, got a job at your local grocery store. No. Yeah, I hate seeing people, again, on Twitter. Yes. You know, a bunch of, you know, uh, older, older boomers, yes. if I dare say, say, and just go get a job, stop complaining. And it's yeah. like, girl, people are actually really trying. And also, college costs tens of thousands of dollars nowadays hundreds of thousands of you include if you depending on your school and if you include all four years you right. know so it's kind of like um they it does not cost four grand for all four years like it used to back in your day you know well, it's not like that anymore it's they college is an industry built on taking everything that you have and setting you up in life um questioning everything you know and yeah. it's like my parents so my parents never graduated college right like well my dad went for like a year and before like dropping out which like mm -hmm. fair and then my mom like mm -hmm. never went right she's just mm -hmm. efficient at what she does and stuff with, with us she like started off bartending before like getting like her dream job with him or like a dream job for her within things which as like an agent um which is like gr really great for both of them um but it's like the whole thing is for like i I feel like, and it could have been different if you lived in this, if, if I lived in this time, right? But I feel like those generations have lived in a time that's so different from us, you know? Um, mm -hmm. where, where the costs don't, like, just overwhelm and stuff. Yeah, and also, you know, back then, you could not go to college and still get a good job. Yeah. These days, it's kind of like the bare minimum is a degree. That yeah. You should be having a degree, period. So if you don't go, you're screwed. If you do go, you're screwed. Um, well, so you just really have to work, make it work for yourself. And and that's the big thing within it too and stuff, because it's like um, for all the young people who are like in in here and stuff, because it's like I don't know who who want, who will wind up watching this, but there's got to be some people who are like, oh my gosh, college in a year. Hi kids, make sure you look really deep into everything and stuff, because it's like it's a complicated process. Like let's be very clear. I don't think a single generation of like young adults slash teenagers have had as hard have as many like challenges presented as Gen Z winds up getting right because it's like you have to manage your schoolwork to get into a good college and that process starts all the way in middle school because like elementary school it's like silly goofy you know but like middle school you're prepping for high school and then high school you're prepping for college and then college you're prepping for your job it's 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 such a production line for like people you know oh it very much is yeah it very much is like which which uh archetype of a human person are you going to fall into and you have yeah. to figure that out really fast and if you don't figure it out uh there's not much to help you right if you get it wrong if you figure it out wrong you know and yeah. a lot of people growing up don't don't get it most i'd argue most children because again they are children applying yep. to college. They're still most likely a minor, you know, and even if they are 19, that's, you're still so young, yes. you know? Um, like the children are not going to know fully what the heck's going on. And then if they don't make the right decision now, it's going to be harder later, but you know. And uh, there's other layers, there's right, it. where like wanting to go to art. I don't know if you dealt with this because I know that you, you mentioned, or I don't know if you mentioned on the show yet, but you were, you were a drama major, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a film major, right? Like, I don't know if you dealt with the whole, oh, are you sure it's something you want to do? Pressure and stuff yeah. from people around you. Because it's like, those majors don't seem outworthy. Like, they can get jobs. Which, by contrast, I actually think that an arts degree, um, you'll learn enough skills from your core and stuff that are, like, soft skills that you'll be pre prepared for a lot of jobs, I think, you know? Yeah, no, I absolutely... I mean, I really disagree with that whole, you know, notion. I know the year before me or i guess the year above me that graduated yes. before i did uh when they were at their graduation ceremony like for drama specifically for the the drama tish program at right. uh, at my school adam sandler adam sandler came in and spoke at the, at the talk at the drama graduation that's like fun. first of all mr sandler what are you doing here second of right. all the whole speech from what i've heard you know i wasn't there from what i've heard the whole speech was basically him going wow adults aren't you parents aren't you guys so happy that you wasted all this money on your oh my children gosh. In four years at this <laughs> at this art college that was like pretty much the whole he was just bagging on them for wasting four years of their life and adam what are you doing man? like that is so ass i got lucky at my 
we had an amazing actor. Of course, I'm forgetting his name right now, but we had this amazing actor that uh, came in, and he's I was you know a slight fan of him, and he made an amazing speech. But no, I just you know I started going down this art path because I majored in drama and I minored in business, like production yeah. and entertainment. So you know I've got like a, a producing a business side to you know the drama side as well, and mm-hmm. I had a pretty holistic uh, theater art making experience because I also was on you know off the camera off stage yeah. stuff as well so I kind of got like the whole thing and that taught me I mean, everything I mean everything that I've applied today for my you know current profession as right. someone who speaks on YouTube uh, I've learned because of my drama and you know this teacher that I had in high school he said this thing to me and it really just knocked my socks off he said there are as many unemployed lawyers as there are unemployed actors yeah. because both fields are so competitive and so hard to get through and yet people see that if you become a lawyer that's more uh worthwhile and more uh has more substance than someone uh acting i mean yeah saving people's lives or you know fighting right. for law or justice yeah okay sure that is more important than someone pretending to be somebody on stage but uh in terms of career wise and i i don't know i just i really i really disagree and if you're able to make it work um make it work but also going into an art degree you're gonna have to understand that it is a really competitive field that's why i turned to youtube because i wanted to make my own platform for myself and not wait on someone to give me a chance i wanted to give my own self a chance so. i think that's one of the other genius things about any arts career right when you think mm-hmm. about it like the lawyers they can't really like um crowdsource their own careers right um right. but artists we can always crowdsource our own careers by making something that gets a fan base around us so people have to notice us right like mm-hmm. if, if a lawyer's not getting casework right or, or whatever lawyers do <laughs> yeah silly, silly little bookworms who no sorry silly little speech and debate kids um <laughs> <laughs> I actually they respect are. lawyers a lot. I was a speech and debate kid. Do not, do not worry, world. Um, <laughs> We're just joking. Uh, slash yes, please, please, lawyers, do not cancel me on Twitter. Um, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like you, we like we've seen it. We've been seeing it more and more often. I feel like people online actually making it pretty big into the, whatever industry they're trying to work on and stuff, right? Because it's mm-hmm. like one of my one of my favorite cases of it all is Bo Burnham's one of my favorite like creators of all time, right? Um, mm-hmm. And he literally, like, self-made, got himself um, a career making these stand-up specials, um, films, t- worked on TV. Love loved that man, by the way. Um, you, did you say Bo Burnham? Yes, Bo Burnham. Oh, yeah, period. Yeah, Mr. period. Mr. Burnham. Uh, Mr. Burnham. I, I discovered just last year Zach Stone is going to be famous, and that show's so funny. Zach Stone? Is it going to be f- Wait, I haven't heard of it. Okay, so it's basically an MTV show that he got in the early 2010s. And the uh-huh. whole shtick about the show is he's a recent high school grad, and he uses his college fund to buy a production crew so he can make his own TV show about his life. Um, okay. But he's not very talented at, like, anything, right? Well, like, he got accepted <laughs> yeah. at Emerson, which is pretty good. But at the same time, like, um, the, sh- the entire show is one of the most, like, cringe comedies ever. But I love it every single second. Or, I, l- I love most of it. The middle's a little dry, but I love the majority of it, and what it's representing because it's like he makes his own like fake cooking show and then there, it's it's a it's a very fun show if you like if you like Bo Burnham's stuff I'd recommend it he's he, it's like him in his like early to mid 20s too oh I love that I had no idea about that I think yeah. I that out that's so cool well my favorite project of his is like 8th grade I don't know if you've watched that no I haven't no you know I'll be honest I have not been watching any TV for the past year that's fair i'm so behind on tv it's like a weird thing that's a movie but yeah that's so fair movies oh it's too, a movie yeah. it's movies too okay yeah. last movie i saw was mean girls i like mean <laughs> girls honestly i know i saw your your video on it and i was like finally because it's just like stop people are so angry well, <laughs> you know people are so angry my whole thing right is i actually think the the new movie of mean girls was my favorite thing from the whole franchise i know that's a hot take somewhat nowadays right but, like, mm-hmm. what I think it did really, really well that made it stand out from the crowd for me is I thought the directing of that movie was so good. It's one of the... It's a movie musical that knows to have fun with what it is. And there's several sequences, which is, like... I'm not the biggest fan of the songs, really, either, right? 
but it's mm-hmm. like several sequences the the flow the cinematography the dancing um made made the songs feel way more alive and way better right like i love the way that film integrated social media for its sequences oh i agree i feel like films drop the ball a lot on capturing social media i mean i think uh mean girls did it in a little bit more of an exaggerated way but they're the most i guess accurate form of adopting social media into like a film well, that like, i've seen, you know within the whole editing of it right because it's like i mm-hmm. see other fi- like one of my personal like underrated films of all time i also made a video essay on called not okay which basically mm-hmm. the whole story of that film right is there's a uh, um is a girl a girl uh basically fakes going on like a writer's treat in paris to impress um dylan o'brien or, or who's playing a, char- a pl- character named Colin, right? But then there's like a terrorist attack, right? Where right where like she said she's going, and then she fakes being a victim of it for social media attention and stuff. And mm. the the movies, it's and the whole thing is right. She's a very unlikable character, right? But the movie knows it and plays so well with it, and that's what made it like stand out, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But like so many movies have these like influencer type characters and don't properly like understand where their morality is yeah i agree and it's also because like especially when you have influencer type characters um a lot of the people who are writing it are people who aren't really in tune with you know content creators they kind of just kind of have like this idea and this kind of stereotype to it and that they that's all they know which is you know to some extent a form of laziness and also an extent of just you weren't raised in this internet sphere so to an extent you won't get it you know well it's crazy to me too because it's like i feel like we're right on the bubble right of like a new generation really getting to take over whatever we need to and stuff with it Mm -hmm. because it's like i think like one of my things as a writer is i hope like in my works can like hope bring whatever this next wave is and stuff and like reanalyzing the themes that gen z's grown up with because the old guard that's had had control of things for so long right um, they don't understand a lot of the themes that they've been, like, starting to get into. And it's how we've had, like, especially in, like, latter 2010, some of the worst, like, teen movies ever. Because, like, I'm, I'm somewhere where it's, like, I don't know about you, but, like, I've got a pretty big love of, like, teen movies and films and stuff, right? Like, uh, Disney Channel original movies, love them. Whatever, like, young adult movies are made and stuff. Just stuff that's interesting to check out, you know? Yeah. No, I, I miss those. We don't really see a lot of those. I feel like yeah. these days, you know. But I haven't seen Bottoms, but I hear Bottoms is amazing. It's very good. And that's like a teen. That's like a teen movie that I feel like is a great, and I can't wait to watch it. I um, wound up liking that one a lot. Yeah. Yeah, um, I I can't I can't wait. But I know you mentioned this. I think in regards to the other movie, but with Mean Girls, it I immediately I could tell they weren't really taking themselves too seriously. Right. Like it was, can't be in a way of like, yeah, this is a a musical, a re a remake musical of a tradition. We are gonna have fun with this and have fun. I did, and that was the whole purpose of the movie was to have fun. And they weren't super serious about yeah. it. And I think people are being too serious with it. Well, I still think back to the bit where um where they have like during the whole intervention they reference like the musical number in the movie that was really funny to me and stuff that fourth. That fourth wall jo- joke caught me off guard, and the whole thing yeah. is there's such a market for like campy musicals out there. Like one of my one of my favorite campy musicals is I love Hairspray to Pieces. That movie is both yeah. so much fun as well as being so. I think Hairspray covers its themes so well and mm-hmm. stuff too. Um, that's okay. actually one of probably in my top ten musicals out there. To be honest, I don't have the list for that set up right, but it's like Hairspray <laughs> is a show I'm very close to. Yeah, I love Hairspray, too. I'm not a huge musical person, even though I, I am a recovering theater kid. Um, recovering? <laughs> recovering, absolutely. Yes, of course. Uh, as fast as, as I can. Does. Yep. <laughs> but Steadfast. I never, I never really like musicals. I only like musicals where the songs actually, like, forward the plot. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, for example, The Music Man does not. Yep. <laughs> the Music Man just kind of, like, you know, we just talked about being in the library. Here's another three-minute song about being in the library. I, you know, I that kind of stuff. I was in that show, so... Not, Oh, I, I was in State Fair, girl. Uh, uh-uh. uh, State Fair. 
terrible. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. You're really... good. Don't worry. In sixth I grade, I was cast as Winthrop in Music Man, right? Because I was this. Uh, mm-hmm. So the thing for me, I am canonically short. I'm five foot five, which is like my got canonically yes, um, which <laughs> by guy standards is short, right? So I uh, and I've mm-hmm. always been relatively short in a good way, you know. Like short, short people yeah. kind of thrive being theater kids. It's we. Um, First of all, there's nothing wrong with being short, by the way. Being short's pretty awesome. I'm proud of y'all if you are. Um, but short, short things. Yes. But, we'll be. but the whole thing with it, like, I was shoehorned in my early middle school years as, like, little, um, my, that was my, my era where they put me as, like, kid roles, right? Because of that whole mm. thing. And then high school, high school by that time, I don't know if you ever, like, felt with, within, like, a theater group that you're being, like, lost in the crowd of people and stuff. Where it's like you're not really getting lead roles, you're not getting a lot to do, and you have to find yeah. some way to stand out. And my way of standing out was taking the little lines that I was given and basically stealing the scene with them. Period. That's what you do. Um, do you know the show All Shook Up? Oh, I know it, but I don't know it. Valid. You know no what worries. I mean? Yeah. Like I've heard I of it, but I don't know. <laughs> we we did that show in my junior year, right? Which I think it's so funny that they did Elvis, but Twelfth Night, you know? Um, oh yeah yeah i have seen that yeah i went to go see that another production actually i know yeah you're talking. Mm-hmm. i actually love the way that that integrates its songs like it does feel like things slow down a bit with it but it's like i feel like within it slowing down everything still feels pretty epic and they're good like character moments right because there's like a few ways to do like theater things right and i think a lot of the, a lot of the worst musicals as you mentioned just like slow down whenever they have a song going on but it's like I think also having songs that like showcase like the soul of the character. I think some other mm-hmm. thing that's good. And I I from from what I remember, right? It was twenty eighteen, so that's six years ago, which is weird to say. Um, oh God! Right? That's um, so weird. But so the show was fun to do. Um, but the my whole role within there is I had a bit role as a bus driver, right? And my mm-hmm. whole shtick, right, if you want to get noticed in theater and you're a background role, go as loud and over the top as possible and have a fun hecking time doing it. So mm-hmm. this, so the two, like, lovebirds, because, oh gosh, the other weird thing, right, so the show's about race, right, and, like, um, race, rela- race um, racism and stuff, because the main two characters want to get together, um, regardless of being, like, different races, and then the mom mm-hmm. or the mayor of the town doesn't like that. But the thing with the, the, the thing now... The th- thing about the state of Maine, right? It's very white. You can't. We didn't really have a lot of students of color in our school, so the solution that we had to everything was we used the alternate version that just subbed out all the race-based lines for class. Okay. <laughs> it's very problematic, but it was it was high school, you know. It's yeah. Gosh, they just don't do. I don't know. It's a good message for people to listen to, but also like, yeah, you know, one of my high schools did. Uh... Arabian Nights, I think it was called. Yeah. Uh, and it was a predominantly everybody in the cast should be Middle Eastern, and there was nobody in the cast oh. that was Middle Eastern. So it was like, hmm, now why are Her. we doing this? Well, hmm. so well, so that director, right? Like, I enjoyed our director, but she had a history of picking weird shows like that. So this next show that she picked was Peter Pan. Oh, okay. Which, uh, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So I we went, ha- oh. So we had to basically reskin the, or that's a weird way to phrase it, reskin, but like rework the whole like um, mm-hmm. native element around something else to make it like better. We replaced an entire song. My role for that show was I was the token cross dressing furry. I played a dog. I played Nana. Um, so they shoved me in a dog costume. That's so iconic. Dude, she is a good little, she is a good dog, and I was proud of the role, right? Because it's like I go, I you ate it up. It was fun. I enjoyed it. But, like, um, my parents, of course, wanted me to get a better role, which is, like, understandable, but also, no, I'm fine with this. Yeah, and it's, it, I, I mean, for me, because I got, you know, minor bit roles the whole time until I was, like, yeah. a senior, and then I got, you know, major roles then. But it's, uh, it's humbling, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, you kind of just, like, yeah, I don't take myself too seriously, and you just, I don't know. I think those instances of always being cast as smaller roles and rejection and yep. failing quote unquote failing uh i think is actually really important for uh, everybody because and i feel like that's so stereotypical for me to say it, but truly 
uh, I am very glad because um, I think I'm pushing through to this day and yeah. doing what I'm able to do and still believing in myself. And uh, I think it's I think it's really healthy. So I'm glad personally that I didn't get those that I didn't immediately start succeeding, whatever that means, you know, yeah. immediately getting big roles, immediately getting everything I wanted, because then, you know, I don't think I would have been as strong as I am today. That well, makes so sense. I think that's a big thing for artists, though, in general, because about resilience is one of the biggest traits about this whole field, right? Because it's like mm -hmm. my whole stance is if you stay in something long enough and build yourself up and get better, then, of course, you'll eventually get noticed, right? But, mm -hmm. or you, you, sorry, you might eventually get noticed. There's some people who will be like, um, that's not true. But I feel like the longer you stay at something, the more likely you are to have some sort of success with it, right? Mm -hmm. And I, mean, I think it really depends on what it is you're yeah. going after because i truly believe that for uh content creation on the internet if you yeah. keep going and keep making good stuff i think eventually you will get you will get an audience well dude content creation is one of the funniest cycles and stuff too because it's like it's so random sometimes what actually like blows up like it is, the yeah. algorithm is an unforgiving god at points mm -hmm, it not is gonna lie to you. no absolutely it's it's doing everything possible that's why i have to like let it go that's why right. i have to be like okay, I know in my heart that I have written the best thing I could write. I have recorded the best thing. I have edited the best thing. I have made the best thumbnail and title to my abilities. Mm -hmm. And I just have to let it go at that point and let the algorithm do its thing. Well, because sometimes you figure it out, other times you don't. And it, that's, just, that's just how it is. Fly, baby bird, fly, you know? Yep, yeah, water off a duck's back. It's... Or else I'm going to die, dude. I'll be so stressed and i've just i mean after this whole it's been like a year now i think mm -hmm. of me being on online officially like on youtube and stuff whoa exciting and i know right so exciting and it's only like recently am i able to be like you know whatever happens happens yeah because it's been you know up and down for sure well but. i think that's another major thing within it right because it's like i feel like there's just those complexities within how much something is going to wind up working and what's going to what are going to be the right ways to go about um doing something and mm -hmm. it's such a process of trial and error and trying to figure things out and finding your own identity because the whole thing with youtube right is it's a very um it's not overpopulated but there's a there's a vast a vast variety of like people out there making content right um yeah. like most topics that exist have been covered at some point um, that's the nature yeah. of, of content creation, right? Um, and it's trying to make your stuff unique and make yourself un stand out in the crowd of a thousand other people who are trying to do videos just like what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And and it's, I don't know, it's it's one of the hardest things to like find an identity with. Like For me, it's like my current channel, it's hitting two years of making content next month, right? But oh, the, I know, a little crazy, but it's mm -hmm. like, I'm not going in as a fresh content creator as far as it goes because I have two other tries and I've been way more successful, successful on this channel than any others. I got like 338 subs, which is still small, but I'm happy with it right now, you know? Um, oh, God. Meanwhile, oh my gosh, my younger brother wound up making, uh, and two of my friends back home wound up making a group channel where they, um, where they basically do like regular show challenge videos and stuff. Like they, uh, did you watch regular show growing up? No, I didn't actually. Wish that, I had, but I didn't. What? What? Okay, we talked about before the, the before the recording Avatar, but like, what was your yeah. what were your other big childhood shows? Oh, SpongeBob. Yep, changed me as a person. Like, it's crazy because I'll do bits and stuff, and like I'll make jokes or I'll edit things a certain way, and like what I make now, and then I'll watch a SpongeBob clip, and I'm like, oh my god, I stole that bit from SpongeBob. I didn't even realize. Like, SpongeBob has formulated me as a person to like my very core <laughs> so, so it's so silly i am part spongebob so you should be afraid if Sp if the spongebob team decides to ever make an episode that's an h-bomber style video um oh about my god plagiarism. <laughs> they're like oh my god e is social <laughs> yeah. no the thing that i stole was the whole like for example if i drop something uh i'll make it, it i'll make it explode which is like <laughs> what spongebob dub does when someone like flies and lands somewhere they always like explode and i thought yeah. that was the funniest thing i okay i was editing i was cooking up and then like i dropped my glasses in one of my videos and i was like i'm gonna make this explode and that's hilarious i am a comedic genius and then i was like oh that's a thing spongebob does i didn't even realize i mean god damn it <laughs> also first of all which editing software do you use oh i use davinci 
the uh, binky. I'm, I'm an Adobe person because that's my school's software, but like, it. it costs way too much money, but like, my school gives it to us for free, so haha, <laughs> gonna steal it while I can. Um, mm-hmm. But, um, no, I, th- I think that's the whole thing, though. It's, it's crazy how much Spongebob as a show has, like, influenced, like, everything for our generations, right? Like, it really is one of the biggest pop cultural influences ever. Do you ever find it weird, by the way, how it's like our years of being born are like older Gen Z? Like, you know, it's because it's, I feel like there's such a cultural divide between like older Gen Z and younger Gen Z. It, and also, is it at the same time? Like, yeah. we are so different, but also so alike. <laughs> so philosophical. Oh, no, but. Like, this is a philosophy podcast after all. A very special philosopher guest, right. you know? Oh, yeah. right. How could I forget? My bad. You're right. My bad. Oops. Time to quote Aristotle. I got yes, you. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Aristotle was a content creator, if you think about it. <laughs> when you think about it, yeah, no. Mm-hmm. Aristotle was the original content creator, you know? <laughs> OG wait, no, influencer. Wait, no. who, are the Bi- who, are, who are the Bible? They're, they're a content creator, too, aren't they? Oh, there was a... They, they produced content, for sure. And, oh, boy, did they influence... Yeah. Arguably the biggest ever. With, well, like, when you think about it, because it's, like, books at the time were the social media of their day, probably, right? Because it's, like, that's the most common, like, form of, like, talking. So people yeah. who wrote, like, books were social media influencers. When you, no. Uh, this this is a weird bit. I swear. This is <laughs> so funny. I bet they, like, had bulletin boards and they would, yeah. like, I don't know, that was, like, their form of Twitter. Yeah. Oh, no, abs- absolutely. That was their Twitter. Um. And the reason why the Twitter bar exists is there was a little blue bird that hung around there and always yeah. like, and always, um, and people would call him Tweet. Um, and he was the inspiration That's for literally. Twitter, actually, you know? It, him, um, Tweet him himself. And yeah. also people, when they wanted to, you know, type and tweet in their private circles, they just, you know, gave a little letter to the pigeon. And the pigeon brought it to their circle friends. No, 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 no that, that's the birth of Discord, you know? Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. The two and Discord two, DMs, two and the same. Yeah. Discord pigeons. Discord DMs are literally just pigeon messengers, but like um Aristotle was a Discord uh mod. He was. He he mm-hmm. loved that billboard. He hugged he it did. so dearly with his uh Greek. Is he Greek? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Wanna make sure about that. I was pretty sure. Um, but it's like I, I don't know. It's been years since I took a history class, so um, I thought you're gonna say it's been years since I've talked to the guy. <laughs> you know, yeah. it has been years since I talked to the guy, you know. Yeah, um, he was Greek. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been to Greek, or Greek, Greece, but Greek. On, but it seems like a fun country to explore eventually. I don't know. Oh, I I want to go to Greece so bad, like bucket list. Like I want to just okay. I w- the, all the countries that I want to go to is because I want to go eat the food. Like that's like that's fair though. Like, when I think of Greece, I immediately think of the food that I want to eat. I, um, as someone else who enjoys like discovering like new foods from cultures and trying to exp- see things, the only countries that I've been to like. That, um, well, okay, I went to Cosmo, Mexico once on a Disney cruise while I was growing up, but, like, going to Ireland, the UK, um, they're, they're infamously bad at food, but they're actually pretty good, um, once, mm-hmm. when I was there. Um, fish and you chips. You and I, I huh. went to the UK, too, and their staple is, uh, ooh, curry. Yeah. Very so good. So good. Very um, good. I also, like, the thing in Ireland that they had that I think they probably have in the UK, too, but the whole chipper kind of, like, stores and stuff are like mm. it's weird because it's like small business sort of like fast food like kind of food but they were very good with what it was so it's like i got like from the local one while i was in dublin i got like a garlic cheese fries they had like this garlic sauce on like some cheese mm-hmm. fries and it was very nice when it was like when you need to pick me up at night you know it's like that sounds so good right i Oy. it's it's crazy though because it's like one of those it's so funny because those countries get infamously like dubbed as not good at food often but it's like no even they are like trying with their own cuisine and stuff and figuring out things that are good i don't know i feel like food's all experimentation you know yeah and food in general is just great (laughs) i'm hungry Uh, yeah no that's (laughs) fair e is hungry that e is starving actually Uh, famished (laughs) see it's funny because today was a day where all i had was a bagel breakfast sandwich but it's like yeah. The other fun thing about my ADHD meds is it's like, the meds are like, what if you don't get hungry as much? And I've been thriving off of that lately, which is, or not thriving, but it's like, I've been living off of those, like, whims with that. Because it's like, no. you, get that, you get that hyper focus, and it's it's fine, I'm doing okay, don't worry. Um, okay, good. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm fine with it, I'm fine within it. Um, 
and I've be, I've been monitoring it better over time. It's just the the weird thing with the whole like college process, right? Like, did you, were you on? I'm assuming you were. Did you go to go to like your school's cafeteria often? Yeah. Well, when I was in the dorms freshman year right i uh yeah no i lived off of the cafeteria food well, okay so it was your freshman year that got halfway like coveted like mine mm -hmm. um mine because my i came in um right after the covid like semester where everyone was sent home so we came on mm -hmm. and it was like mask up please no one visiting each other's dorms for the first like year it was weird like that um mm -hmm. such what a weird time it was like in the whole thing with the pandemic right like my parents were afraid to send me to school because they thought we were gonna like be sent home with with no refund right um mm. like oopsie better luck next time don't get coveted um that's literally what happened with us they just sent us home and we didn't get any tuition refund at all it's but we were online so it was like okay see, on, not the same thing but online, okay well, online classes are like so weird within things too because it's like I um because one of my whole things with my ADHD right is it's hard for me to like stare at the class and like mm -hmm. focus that way so what I often did was I like had like an easy game like have you ever played Slay the Spire? Oh I've heard of it. Yeah I, I would often have that one up on one monitor and then on my other monitor um listen to the class like a podcast um that works I feel like that I should have done that I think I just drew that's fair. I feel like that would have helped me. I mean, like, the thing for me, right, is it's, like, multitasking is something where it's always, like, oh, you're not focused on everything at once or something. But, no, I feel like multitasking often can, like, clear the waves of, like, how the brain's working with things. So you got, mm -hmm. like, a few things to think about at once. Because, like, my, my biggest thing with my ADHD is I'm much more of a vacillator, right? Where oftentimes I'm going to be, like, thinking about this topic, thinking about this topic, thinking about this topic, right? And it kind of, mm -hmm. like, smushes it all together and kind of, like, streamlines the whole processes for me. Mm -hmm. No, I totally get that. I mean, I always had to be, when, especially when I'm listening to something, I have to be doing something. As and then I'll absorb everything that you say, actually. Yeah. No, it's... So, no, you said I, I get to something? That. Say again? You said listening to something? No. Yeah, if I'm listening to something... Yeah. I have to be doing something. That's fair. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. um... No, I that that's been a thing for me also with the shows and stuff that I've adopted where it's like I'll um throw a show on on one monitor and then like play like league even if it's like casually like um versus the like bots in the other screen just so I can like multitask and stuff. Um I'm assuming, are you a multitasker when you play Genshin ever or is Genshin a single focus game? Oh yeah, I mean, um, so lately because I'm in pretty like late game Genshin, so gotcha. a lot of so, so you're not familiar with Genshin, I'm not, are you? No. So, do you like? Should I just start from the beginning? <laughs> Go ahead. Don't like no like big Nothing. like lore lore dumps. That could be like another podcast at some point. Oh, Legit. I'm not gonna go into the queer coding of Genshin yeah. Impact on you. Don't worry. I, it, it it's it's a I I I've seen the video on that. So, but oh, really. Or I, wait, I've watched at least part of it. I don't There's know. A lot. I know. Yeah, no, it's you, your videos are good. Like for the whole Genshin thing, it's crazy because it's like I got into you on the one like non Genshin video that you've done in a while. Yeah, you know, so that's the I know you mentioned this earlier about process of like finding yourself as right. like a creator. I started off doing you know Genshin tier lists, talking about ships and stuff. Yeah, and I didn't. It was fun at first, and then I was like, I don't like doing this anymore. Right. And you no, know, I've always been a huge fan of video essays. I was like, I'm gonna make a video essay, and it really worked out because a lot of people really enjoyed it, and I love making them, so it I really works out. Say, I guess you could say your videos, ha video essays, had a Genshin impact on people. It, I'm gonna hurt you through I'm the sorry. Discord screen. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes, they have had a Genshin impact, a Genshin impact. Um, Genshin, Genshin. <laughs> but <laughs> that's that's what I say sometimes. But Understandable. This this recent video, the whole media literacy video, it's you know I've got a plan. I've got I got moves that I am planning. I love Genshin, and it will always be my love and right. my number one. But I am planning on opening up the channel a little bit more. So still doing Genshin Impact videos and then every now and then do a video like the media literacy so right. I did a Genshin Impact video last week I'll be doing another one this week and then I've got another video that's kind of more broadly fandom discussion planned because nice. I like to do I like to have my cake and eat it too and kind of make what I want to make um 
and not be overly limited. And I'm, oh God, am I glad that people enjoyed the media literacy video because that really just um, solidified me into thinking, okay, I can make what I would like to and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be okay. People are gonna enjoy it, hopefully. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I know you only came to me for the media literacy, and then I, you looked at my channel, and it's all Genshin gay stuff. But but, but, but I'll be following it because I I enjoy. Um, I've been very I'm I I don't talk like explicitly about it. I'm very familiar with the second thing, um, and mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm slowly learning about the first thing. So yeah, no, that's great, and I'm I'm happy that I could have like you know an audience that's you know sometimes interested in this or interested in that, and I could you know branch out that way so it's, it's all part of the plan well i feel I like i feel like it's it's really interesting because i feel like it's pretty versatile when when you look at things too where it's like mm -hmm. uh, people are always like oh stick within your niche for videos but it's like i feel like building a niche and stuff and like transferring through different things because i see i feel like a lot of creators like one of the fastest ways to grow on youtube i feel like is catering through a fandom right and like riding mm -hmm. that fandom mm -hmm. wave like you watch gravity falls growing up right so, uh, gravity falls yes Yes, I loved Gravity Falls. I love Gravity Falls too. Well, it's crazy because it's like a lot of channels like rose from the Gravity Falls fandom and stuff, and have emerged mm. now and stuff to cover other things. And it's like I feel like whenever there's like a new fandom, we always have those like fandom influencers that emerge and stuff. But it's like it's always good to mix it up, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I've always that's what got me into YouTube is because I wanted to I wanted to talk about Genshin Impact with people because nobody that i knew irl you know like uh, knows about the game um and now i'm like i'm still gonna make genshin stuff but also you know i could do other stuff too and it's just it's cool that i'm able to kind of pull it off like so far yeah so yeah it's but... it's cool i mean it's it's good to have something to jump you off and then also have a audience that's willing to you know see what else you want to talk about well, so the thing for me was the the I, I see things on Genshin like pretty frequently, right? Like it's pretty big. Mm -hmm. Like I go to a gamer college, so it's pretty well known and stuff here. Yeah, um, yeah. The other thing that I got news from it, the cart, the trading card game that exists within there, looks like something I'd check out eventually. Um, oh yeah, TCG. There's so much. Like that's the thing with Genshin. It's that's why people are able to make their entire channel and their entire niche and their entire career essentially on Genshin Impact because there's so much. Right. There's so much to it. There's the lore, there's the gameplay, there's, you know, a lot of the, a lot of channels focus on how to get the best stats in game, like how to mm -hmm. do bigger numbers damage wise. And others talk about finding out hidden lore things because there's so much lore to it, you know? And then there's people like me that just talk about, hey, what if these two dudes kissed? Um, <laughs> as one and, does. But as one does, uh, yeah. kind of favor in that way, I think. I don't yeah. think anybody else is really, really talking about that, it, like in, to the extent that I am. But, uh, you know, that's the beautiful thing about this game is that there is so much to it that you could literally make, that you could do anything with it. You know, like there's a card game in there if you want, there's yeah. lore if you want that, there's hot characters if you want that. So, well, I think one of the That's other cool. grand things about how Genshin operates for, for me and stuff, or how games operate in general, right? I feel mm -hmm. like oftentimes video games, especially if they're more open like Genshin is, have mm -hmm. so much more that they bring than like a movie or a TV show fandom, right? Because cause there's mm -hmm. only so much media when you look at like a TV and movie franchise that's just like one show or something, right? There's only a, a small amount of official content that, um, but games are way more like longer, I feel like. And games, I feel like you as the sorry for sorry for burping that. I feel like games are something where it's like you as the player have way more customizability and choice of what you do than any other medium, right? Because it's like not normally in like in movies you can only interact with it one way, seeing it, right? But with games, there's usually big parts of the world. There's there's a bunch of everything. That's why MMOs blow up. That's why we have trends. We have franchises like Pokemon that have emerged so strong even today, right? Um, mm -hmm. and I think there's something really special about that. Yeah, I I completely agree. Like I'm on a a Baldur's Gate three kick right now. I am, I you know I know you understand. I don't I can't like anything in a normal amount. And I am so I'm so like obsessed with this game. And it's because like for a time there isn't really spoilers for the game because there's so much you can do in it. You know, like someone might have this character with them for this entire 
duration and right. find out stuff that this character does or you could be like me and not find the character and then they die by accident uh, you know and now you have no idea what that character is all about because they're dead and that was a mistake that was an accident but yeah and I think the Baldur's Gate fandom it, I mean I think it's more special and individual to each person's playthrough but I think the same thing for Genshin too because there's a lot of different reasons and motives for people to be playing the mm -hmm. games and as you said with like movies you know there's only like what are, what's the deeper interpretation of this movie we can debate on but right. like these kind of games it's like what are you playing it for are you playing right. it for damage or are you playing it for lore or are you playing it for this this and this and i feel like video games as an art form because it is it is yeah. an art form i'll fight anybody who says I, I agree with you full heartedly but it is an art form and i think it's one of the best because it's so unique to each person that plays it and um, I think that's yeah. something that's so impressive within it and stuff to within that and stuff too because it's like for the Baldur's Gate thing right like I've not gotten to play Baldur's Gate yet I'm going to at some point I'm just I'm a college student it is it is my curse oh um, I get you girl I get you yeah and then also my computer recently has this thing where if I'm playing a game that's too like graphics intense it's like hey what if we just shut down on you randomly while you're playing <laughs> this um, because my computer even though it was a two thousand dollar computer is getting old and things start to happen around. Mm -hmm. three years of a computer's lifespan like this crazy how yeah. crazy how technology just decides to die on people um i know i thought you were supposed to be eternal man you're exactly technology. right come on i on? thought you were supposed to outlive us come on dude right um ai L. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but with but within that and stuff like Baldur's gate seems fascinating because like are you a D, D fan in general no so i tried to get into D. &D. Oh, this yep. is so sad i tried to get into D, &D but uh, I'm not, I lack the commitment and the right. social battery to be able to meet up with people every single week, Yeah, which is like, they're like my friends, but I just, I don't know. I just, I always want to be alone, which is like my own thing, I guess. You and that's the only reason why I wasn't able to get too into D&D, &D, which I regret, you, you know. You feel like someone who would really favor like one shots and stuff though, like, um, like one shot adventures and stuff where it's like a few hours, um, once, once or so, once or so and it's like kind of self-contained you know i um I, I would really i think i'd really enjoy that too but the one D, &D experience that i had it was over discord during uh, yes. the pandemic and we had to meet up several and oh my one of my closest friends was was the dm and i was the worst first player ever because i was like can i eat this thing and they're like why are you trying to eat everything and i was like can i just roll like let me eat this random pigeon on the ground and they were so over it so no <laughs> I think I'm the greatest See, player to be working with. So it's funny because it's like I so my first characters and stuff were bards. Bard is the class that I would probably be IRL as you would probably be too because you you you're a drama major. Bard bar, bards I feel like are where most content creators like are put and stuff as far as D and D character classes and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But so I um, love fighters. I play I play a lot of those when I do get to play. But I'm mainly a DM nowadays mostly oh, cool. because it um and i don't even get to play too much right like last i've done one one shot in the past like year or so and last it was a halloween one shot right that i ran for an event for a friend of mine and my player showed up to playing and one of them's playing like the whole um i artificer which is like the whole like mechanist class right they're and they're mm -hmm. playing um and their character's name is matt pat and they have a t an automaton named golden freddy that they're with oh so my God. so that's how the campaign starts right and so i take them to like um or basically their whole task with it is they have to go at they have to go and clear out a mansion for a wizard um because he bought this mansion but it's haunted with ghosts so he's like okay guys go go get that you know um mm -hmm. and so they go do that and we're doing the ghost hunting mission but at, but then one of the players has the genius idea of casting grease and then fireball burning the mansion to a crisp where they barely get out of it alive and so mad that they burnt down his house the wizard decided okay screw them and so i teleported them to a pocket dimension that was Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria from FNAF because we had that whole theming of someone having a golden Freddy automaton and then I killed them off one by one um, in a survival mission and it was actually a lot of fun for all of them so I'm happy about that but yeah that sounds so iconic and right up my owie my owie? owie, owie? My, my owie, owie? owie? my <laughs> owie because I oh. sorry because I, uh, you're good because I love Five Nights at Freddy's 
I love Five Nights at Freddy's. So in like a way of like a love hate kind of thing, you know. I so my whole thing is I'm never actually gotten too much into FNAF. Like, okay, I was scared of the games as a kid. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like, so um, valid. So my first content that so my oldest content that's still upright was when I was in middle mm-hmm. school. I f- did like little live streams in like sixth grade where I had my school laptop there so I could like record myself right, and I had my little blue my little Kindle with un, in a blue case, and I would often like hold the kindle up to the camera hoping to record some of it in my reactions it never worked out well but it was a fun thing to try back then um yeah but i got scared of those games so easily dude i got scared when a monster was in minecraft right like i i you were so real um there hmm? no i was about to say because minecraft used to scare me too i thought i was alone no you're not Granted, now things like this have happened nowadays. There's a tw- there's a clip that exists on my Twitch where I was playing Minecraft right casually as one does, and th- mm-hmm. then I hit a llama, and the llama started chasing me, and I got scared of it to the point where I hid in my house, and the m- llama clipped through my wooden plank house block, uh, yeah. and its face stared right into my house at me, and the f- clips were visibly like me oddly freaking out. Um, and I hid in my house for like 10 minutes because I was afraid of dying. Um, <laughs> by a llama. Death by a llama. Via llama. <laughs> yeah, no, that llama side, yeah, it's real. No, it, llama side is real. And Minecraft, people look at me strange when I say that it scares me because it's the, this the ambiance of it. Right. Just standing there, I feel like I'm being watched. I don't know. My number one op is Minecraft, apparently. I'm, I'm so like... I'm glad that I'm not alone. No, I mean, like, I think that's completely understandable and how things go for people often. Like, Minecraft's such an iconic game. Like, Minecraft's another one of those games where it's, like, its fanbase has allowed, existed for so long because you can play it however you like. It's very much so in the hands of the players, which I think is one yeah. of the other essentials for whatever franchise to survive, right? Because it's, like, mm-hmm. if there's an infinite source of players coming out and stuff, there's an infinite source of content that you can make out of it. That's how we've had, mm-hmm. like, things, like... It's crazy when you think about the whole, like, Dream SMP domination that happened a few years ago and stuff and how long that existed for. Um, yeah, and still kind of continues to. Oh, yeah. You know, like, the some of the biggest creators on the platform are Minecraft players. It's still yeah. years after the game released, and I don't think any other game has had that sense of longevity and grip on popular culture still you know well and the whole thing with it that i think is so impressive right is it's it's actually just one of the most chill games out there and stuff like yeah. when i was playing it originally as like a little kid um someone one of my friends was te- it was in like third grade where someone was like recommending it to me and then in fourth in fourth grade i got or like third or fourth grade i got the game and downloaded and stuff and then the trend really begins and of course, like content, watching content creators play games is a big thing. Um, my my Minecraft creator um, that I started out with is problematic. It was Tobuscus, who I watched first with things. Oh no! Uh, right, but like the whole thing about his stuff was like it's as awful as he as certain things have come out about him. Um, Dude, like, his songs were so infectious when you were, like, a little kid. Like, the early 2010s, he was my content, one of my the first content creators I got really hooked on. Um, of course, but he was it's... a biscuit guy, right? The... Yes, no good in a biscuit. Yep. Um, that was that was a, a good portion of my life for a good week. Good, good few weeks, actually. Dominated my every thought. <laughs> well, it's, like, it's crazy, because it's, like, early 2010s YouTube was such a unique place when you think about it. Um, mm-hmm. We have so many different things just showing up around then where it's like creators were able to carve out their names way more, right? Like what a, a big reason why I think a lot of like the older creators have like a lot more like problematic things, I guess, come out, right? Is because mm-hmm. the, their time things were way less like um, bi- built on like knowing who someone was, I think, more so. Like there's still some element of parasociality to it, but it's like less intense than it is nowadays. Um, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. It's, but I'm like, I'm actually pretty impressed with like any creator who got to like s- secure themselves around then. Like I, um, early YouTube was just a place of like kind of legend to be honest within, within what was rising within it. And it's like, I love the state we're in nowadays. Cause I feel like we're in the golden age for like video essayists and talking about what you want and stuff. But it's like, mm-hmm. it, it's crazy how much has changed within just like 10 years with within just a few years and stuff on the site things are always just changing yeah it used to be like you know at there was one point in time because i i grew up on youtube you know i feel yeah. like i just this is the platform that i've grown up 
like I know it so well. Yeah. And there was a time when I feel like I've I did know or was familiar with almost every single prominent player. Yeah. Um, because they were the ones to really say that you can make a job online. You can make online a job. Mm. Um, and they went through so like the whole demonetization, the whole yeah. you know there was so many there was so much with the the platform itself. Not only these creators trying to you know figure out where they are and where they land in the whole grand scheme of pop culture. Yeah. Uh, the, the platform itself was still trying to figure a lot of things out. Um, and and then growing up and seeing, you know, some of those names fiddle out, some of those names get called out or stay, yeah. like Markiplier. Um, it's really cool now to see that. I mean, I'm really glad that I started when I did because yeah. the platform has figured it out to the most, to the most part, comparatively to the past. Mm. And... Like they kind of got their whole shtick down pretty much. And it's really cool to see that there are so many people, so many creators, and a lot of them I've never heard of, and yet they're still so uh, important to a lot of people. And I just think that's really cool. Like it's just, you know. Yeah. And it, you're right, it has grown in such a short time if you think about it, like such a short time. Well, so other things like that I think about, like, one of my current, like, newer favorite creators that I've discovered is Sophia, like, Nygaard, who, like, um, mm. I, I think that's how I pronounce her name, but she does, like, a lot of, like, she did a video where she basically went and saw, like, every celebrity chef's, like, um, r- restaurants on Las the Las Vegas? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I saw that one, too. Yeah. So, I fell in love with her videos recently. They are the coziest videos, like, legit, mm-hmm. she, she, so much theater kid energy. It's, it's kind of funny when it, when it was, like shown in her videos like she's friends with like matt pat so it's similar vibes there dude also i didn't watch too much of matt pat's videos but i love that man from everything about his energy um yeah i miss him i i, I know him. he's not he even left yet but like, that's a crazy thing to me you know yeah it's it's crazy when oh because he's he's one of the most arguably just top 10 i feel like successful people yeah. from this platform because he not only just makes like youtube videos he's done even more and especially with his consulting gig as well he is just and he i feel like he's been behind a lot of the changes for the platform yeah. he really is a giant and it's crazy that there wasn't like some controversy that he decided to tackle and then you know get stepped down from he just literally was like this is this is it you know and that's crazy i even matt pat's leaving it's I think the thing that's so crazy that a lot of people have been realizing about YouTube as time has moved on is I feel like everyone's channel has a ticking clock attached to it, right? Where it's like yeah. either something, either you're no longer relevant, people view it as, or people like decide to move on for other things. Like for me, I, I know that if I ever like make it like a big hee hee as a video mm-hmm. essayist, um, I, I'm not going to be doing it for longer because I want to migrate to the film industry, right, eventually. Or like yeah. building something else up but it's like the whole thing with youtube and stuff is it's a really great way to establish it but it's like it's kind of crazy when you think about like how these like stars emerge and then things can like fall out for people so quickly like the online world's mm-hmm. so volatile like content wise where it's like people who, who are doing great just a year ago can be in obscurity now or people um and people can rise from the ashes in like minutes i think it's one of those fascinating landscapes where both the content's so interesting and then the stories of the individual creators are so fascinating too like we were talking earlier a bit about like drama stuff and when you think about it because it's like every youtuber who establishes themselves sort of plays themselves as a character you know Mm -hmm, and it's one giant soap opera whatever drama is happening between like creators and stuff that's like emerging it's like a hollywood but it's like at your fingertips um, it it is and it's it's interesting because like we've got people like Curtis Connor and like yep. Danny Gonzalez that get like two million views in like yeah. two days, you know? And it's kinda like what other form of media is present that can reach that many people immediately, well, you know? Right. And be so personal yet for millions of people. And it's 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 also strange because you said something about like how each channel has a ticking time clock, which I completely agree with, and I that's with every you know career and everything right. that you create. But also, I feel like that was especially true for people like Jenna Marbles, and mm-hmm. you know, for the 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 people who really started it all with YouTube yeah. and making you know, YouTubers a thing. But I feel like nowadays it's so relative because there could be someone like I think. Brittany Broski is 
personally from my viewpoint for from my recommended she's becoming one of a household name from youtube like she's on her way to becoming a household name for youtube I, I and love yet her there stuff. could be someone oh, i love britney i love her so much so but there could be know? someone else yeah there could be someone else with their youtube recommended and they've never even heard of miss broski before. right so it's kind of like are you really slipping into obscurity or are you just having a different recommended now? You know, and it, I feel like obscurity is so relative nowadays because if you're still getting views and you're still like making a, a career off of it, it's hard to say that you are obscure because there really is no number one limelight anymore. Um, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Like mm -hmm. another one of the things that I've been thinking about, right? Cause it's like, we, everyone talks about how like TV as like linear cable and stuff is completely declined nowadays, right? Like, while we were growing up, it was, like, whatever shows were going on. Shout out to iCarly for being, like, one of the generational shows also for us. Real. Um, mm -hmm. um, but, like, when you think about it nowadays, things that are on TV and stuff get n very little views compared to what's happening online, right? Um, yeah. Like, the the kids' channels, right, were, like, making, like, millions of viewers around our time. They're, ma they're barely struggling to get, like, 100,000 kids to tune in nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. which is a big sign of like changes in the demographic because like a lot of kids are going to YouTube more than they are to actual cable or to Netflix, which is such a site, such a such a web, oh, such God. a such a thing that changed the way that media was viewed. And mm -hmm. I think the thing that I find so fascinating within everything here, right, is mm -hmm. the fact that uh, is the fact that like online, I feel like ever like th there's big events like the Super Bowl, right? But it's like. I feel like someone, if they got their sponsorship instead of in the Super Bowl and in a Mr. Beast video, I feel like they'd instantly mm -hmm. get way more payback for that and stuff, right? Um, like, th like the domination of, like, Mr. Beast and stuff, and I say this as someone where it's, I'll tell you the more lore after the recording, but I was in a Mr. Mm -hmm. Beast video, by the way. Um, oh, really? I'll tell you that lore in a, in, a, in a little bit after, but yeah. Did you get any money? I got $1,000 and a free trip what? to Bahamas. I'll, I'll explain to you after, I promise. Um, <laughs> oh my god, can I get into Mr. Beast video? <laughs> That's so um, cool though. But it's like, things like that are able to like, make so much money and like, really change culture with the products that he promotes and stuff, right? It's, yeah. it's something where it's like with TV and stuff, there's like that lack of a connection that I think people have. And it's like crazy because it's like my parents are still glued to TV over like YouTube and stuff. Like my, what my mom watches on YouTube, right, is DUI videos. She's addicted to those. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's like the worst part of true crime. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, that's so funny. No. Yeah, no. But, huh? Yeah. Yeah. No, continue. No, continue. No, but it's like, I think it's crazy because it's like there's generations that are still brought up on the whole TV thing, but it's like, I think TV itself is starting to fall, it's falling more and more out of favor and it's going to be, cr it's going to be really interesting to see what emerges with the new streaming world as far as things go um, and how media itself is going to get pushed in new directions because it's like the, um, we're starting to see, because it's like, I genuinely believe that like media influencers are the new artist trendsetters, right? It's like, mm -hmm. um, I think the, with the power that they've been able to command, with the audience that they've been able to get, with the momentum that things have, we're going to be living in a world where it's like, I, th I think so social media, right, it is considered partially mainstream, but it's like my parents wouldn't know who like people are online, right? But we're going right. to get to the point where everyone's going to know who a lot of these names are and stuff, I think, which is going to be pretty crazy when our generation much more takes over. Let alone the children who've been raised from on YouTube kids from the ground up, right? Oh right. gosh. Do what? You, do you you see the whole YouTube kids thing, right? And how terrifying what's being shown to these kids is, right? Nope. Okay. I, I honestly I have not been looking so this, <laughs> at YouTube kids. No worries. This wasn't on YouTube kids actually, but like I was taking a bus, right? Um, as one mm -hmm. does. And I sat next to a mother who had a child on her lap because that's where my assigned seat was. And when you have a child who's like two, right, they're mm -hmm. allowed to sit on their mother's lap instead of getting their own seat, as one does. So mm -hmm. the mother falls asleep and the kid starts scrolling on YouTube to the point that he's watching Grand Theft Auto videos of <gasps> Venom killing Spider-Man um, on, on his phone. He's two years old, right? He's just swiping through this out loud for everyone to hear. The bus driver's like, can someone, can, if you're listening to stuff, can you please use headphones? That is a child. They do not have headphones. Their mother fell asleep. Um, same child would go on to play out loud for the bus to hear both Baby Shark and Crazy Frog, so. 
damn double whammy i know that's see that uh i feel like it's another topic for another time is the whole moderation of like what is the content creator's role in making sure their content is safe for children is that the content creator's job is it the platform's job right. is it the mother's job i'm of the opinion that it is the mother's a- or the parents and but primarily the platform's job like if there is a child using the platform they should it should be really heavily regulated that you are not able to leave the youtube kids area right you should not leave this area specifically made for kids if the platform is you know allowing children of that age to be on there because like i don't honestly don't think it's the creator's job because the creator's going to be making what they make but if you're logan paul dude and you're making stuff primarily marketed towards children then yeah that's your job if you're trying to get children to watch your stuff and you click yes this video is made for kids on youtube.gov then yeah you need to have some sort of responsibility but that's crazy they Dude. kids ah uh, that's a whole thing people, people <laughs> you know? like logan paul it's kind of crazy because it's like okay the, i've been noticing this whole trend with a lot of like problematic creators right where it's mm-hmm. like i've noticed how bad they are with their actions right but it's so crazy because a lot of these people have like an inherent charm which is really random that they have with it right mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. like okay and this is even this is weird but right you know you know the toxic gossip train video right how could I not? So the famous, toxic infamous gossip, gossip train. train. Um, <laughs> as as awful as that video is, I could totally see as a er, as a kid why people enjoyed Colin Colin Ballinger, which is really mm-hmm. weird because that's like the worst apology to give ever. But it's like I don't know. There, it's it's so crazy how some people with like this innate charisma that brings people to them just are able to get these giant platforms and be so toxic on them and stuff. Uh, like, I don't I don't know which Paul it is. I think it's the older Paul brother. Is that Logan? Is Logan? Yeah, the older Logan's one? the older Paul. I, I mean I saw a, a video essay talking about, you know, how he's like the villain of YouTube, which he is, absolutely. Yeah. And I I know Logan Paul's um crimes. Yes. <laughs> I know he's not a good person. And then I watch footage of him and I'm like, what a charming guy. No, and I have to catch legit. myself like Oh my god, this dude is scamming children. <laughs> this right. This dude is scamming children. Why, why do I think he's charismatic? Because he is, and that's why he's so popular. Well, so the whole thing with it and stuff, too, is that's why he was able to, like, for for longer than most people, he was able to, like, he was able to do that whole apology tour and stuff. Like, the best video on this whole stuff was D'Angelo Wallace's coverage of the Paul Brothers is amazing. Um, I need to watch it. It's so good. Um, but so the whole thing, like, it's because it's like this is another thing I was wild because, like, I've been following um, WWE a bit since the Eye Patch Wolf video, right? That I watched. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. Logan Paul's like now a now a, re- a big time like wrestler with them and stuff as he's scamming mm. people with like Crypto Zoo and stuff. It's the duality of man, truly. Right. It's it's crazy. Absolute it's... insanity. And then he gets away with it. Yeah, and I think a lot of a lot of be, a lot of times he gets away with the things that we don't know all the time is because his audience unfortunately is primarily children and they don't know that they don't care. They, can, they don't know they don't care. They don't know to go to Twitter, make an expose thread on this yeah. why this recent video is problematic or so on. Uh, and I mean that's the thing is a creator is not truly canceled unless their audience cancels them what because outside audiences of youtube can cancel somebody but if the actual audience doesn't care then the creator will be fine every single time which is part of why the whole like h bomber guy james somerton cancellation was so big because they did share an audience in a lot of ways um yeah i can't wait to watch that you're in for a treat when you get to that one um but the the fun thing um and it is we're we're enough in where i we're gonna start wrapping up shortly but um mm-hmm. but um in my script that i'm writing right i told was telling about this before i've told people who listen to the podcast about this before but the whole become a hashtag peace thing one of my influencers i've designed as logan paul meets keemstar um oh. as a person yeah oh yeah Oh, that's um, literally the devil. Oh, yes. His name is Dagger Drasto, and he goes by the Galaxy. So his, like, introductory match is he's having a boxing match against, like, a pedophile, right? Um, 
which is yeah. just the way to, just the way to like the whole thing is to set up just how he is as a person and stuff um and combine the two's worst traits into some person and he is by far and away okay like as awful as bad people are they are so much fun to write it is oh, so they, much fun to write those they are i love villain characters oh yeah there's so much to them i love i love little scrunkly guys but i wouldn't i wouldn't describe your character as a scrunk no but he is he's he is not a scrunkly guy he is um he's probably the most unlikable of the of that bunch that i've designed there's what like there's the, the, there's a few of them that borderline being like the sort of animator wholesome little bean um but and then there's a few there's a few others that are like more okay but they got, they got their qualities but he's he's the worst person out of them like he um the way he gets captured for this whole thing in my current draft that i have in mind he gets brought in by the police after he accidentally hits a cop car um doing donuts in a parking lot um <laughs> while escaping news coverage and stuff um so it, that's a fun one that was a fun thing to write in um <laughs> That's so cool. I would, I mean, I would love to read it. I'll <laughs> send you what I have at some point, yeah. Um, That'd be so sick. I think it, it's it's a lot of fun for, especially if someone knows, like, the online world and a lot of the culture. Like, we're ma I, I make jokes about literally everything there. Like, one of the mm -hmm. characters is literally made, named Ted Thalmer, and his catchphrase is, I'm Ted Thalmer, I love my wife. Um, oh! Yeah, oh, yeah. Um... <laughs> And his first thing, right, is his um, his wife is like his co-anchor at a news desk, right, for for mm -hmm. B Fox News. That's the name that I came up for, like the BuzzFeed knockoff. Um, mm -hmm. And so the whole thing, my my grand plan with that running a bit, right. The first one is him with his wife at the whole thing, and he's going to become progressively cheating on the. He's just a bit character running around in the background, but he's progressively cheating on like every scene that he's in. Um, wow, that. Right. Hitting the nail on the head right there. I, I think that's... A, well, that's the whole thing with it and stuff, too, because it's, like, when you think about it going for a film audience instead of, like, a YouTube audience, they don't know a lot of the culture and stuff, so you want to go a little more over the top on some of the references and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Just 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 to drive it in a little more and stuff. But, but, like, if you get the context, it gets a lot funnier, you know? Funnier if you yeah. know the online world and the insanity that we got, get up to on this, like, you, YouTube site. Um, but if you don't, you can, like, follow along decently, because it's, like, the character introductions, I think, are pretty solid across the board to introduce who someone is. Yeah, and I think that's really well done. You're not, like, ostracizing anybody, any crowds, but still kind of doing the wink-wink, nudge-nudge to another crowd. Yeah. Um, and I feel like we need more. I mean, there's so much to do with social media and the online, you know, sphere. I feel like yeah. we should have, I want more movies like that. Oh yeah. That's just so no, there's so much there if you do it right. And it sounds like you're doing it amazingly. So that's so cool. It's it's gonna be a lot of fun to do. I can I'll share with you the script within the next few days. I think you'll enjoy it. So but right. okay, before we go, do you have any mm -hmm. projects and stuff that you're that you've been really excited to like work on lately? Yeah. Um I hmm well I guess all the the videos that I'm planning on making. I am making another part to the queer coding in Genshin because, Heck you know, yeah. surprisingly, there's a lot and there's a lot that I still haven't talked about. So I think that'll be our final button up with that mm. uh, series. And then, yeah, I know I'm really excited to do more videos a la the media literacy video, just general fandom stuff because, you know, fandom veteran over here, I got a lot that has happened that I would love to, you know, talk about and to touch on. You've earned your so, fandom battle scars. You've seen things go down. Um, I've got the purple hearts. You know, I've gotten the the awards. I'm so I'm qualified. <laughs> I'm always amazed with like fandom culture and how things always are sh are changing with it. You know, because it's like it is. one and it's one, you know? so powerful. You right. Know? Well, it's like one day X will be a thing, and then another day other things change, and then the online reception of things change things up. And then, and then it's like years can go on, right? Like one of the, one of the other fandoms that I've like not made content for, but like I follow along with is like, do, were you a fan of Total Drama as a kid? Oh no, I didn't watch that. Oh, it's it was okay. Th that was the show where it's so funny because my parents always were like, no, you can't watch this show; it's inappropriate. But I yeah. um, I blame it for getting me hooked on reality TV and stuff. 
But, like, other fandoms that I've unfortunately been in is I've followed the Miraculous fandom. Um, mm-hmm. Chaos there always, at all times. Yeah, I hear, I hear. Um, I, I think Miraculous is the craziest fandom that I've been around, because, like, the ones that I grew up with, Gravity Falls and Steven Universe, were both pretty chill in the grand scheme of fandoms. Yeah, you and that's saying something, because I know the Steven Universe fandom can get quite... Uh, Insane. Rowdy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but that honestly, that's my opinion is every single fandom or every single collection of people for that matter can be bad because the bigger it is, the more chances there are gonna be bad apples and yep. bad apples are really loud. So exactly. uh, it's not even just like this fandom is worse than that. It's kinda like everything is bad if you look at it, if you look for it. You know. Right. And or everything is great if you don't. If you, and if you understand about like the whole psychology of it and stuff like the whole, one of the whole things one of the video essays that I always think about with it all is like have you seen Sarah Zed's um, um, video on Sherlock or no? Oh no I haven't no okay. but I need to watch that are you kidding? So it's a, <laughs> it's, love it's a video about the queer baiting in Sherlock right? Um, oh god and how yeah. a lot of like people in the fandom like there was like three big name fans that like the video would call them the Powerpuff Girls right? Um, Mm -hmm. and they literally, like, coached a bunch of, like, little teens into thinking that the whole thing would wind up ending a way that it didn't go, and Mm -hmm. it's kind of wild, it's just fuck wild when you think about stuff like that happening, it's, oh my gosh, fandom be weird. Fandom do do be weird, and it was shows like Sherlock and Supernatural and stuff, that, like, yeah, (sighs) oh, sorry, (laughs) that, no, I, I, it was me, that was part of that war. It's okay. I feel like I could sniff out fellow super Hulakians, you know? Like, I feel I, like we got, like, a stench on us. I, I was not in that whole thing, but I, um... No, deeply... I can tell. It's okay. Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> you can tell that I'm not, but that I've never had that stench. Good. You don't have the stench on you. There's a certain stench, and I can yeah. smell it, you know, on certain people, which is just so stupid, but... Well, it's, like, I, I, it's so crazy, because the way that fandoms act, like, people often come out of a fandom acting closer to how they were within that and stuff and it's just a complicated web uh speaking of complicated webs ending the podcast um (laughs) very true yeah no how shall we we, well we we well we weave you with uh we wait wait, wait. we weave you you with uh hope you are having a lovely night everyone who's watched this it's gonna go public i don't know maybe this weekend i'll figure it out um, nice. okay. the funny thing about saying this weekend is they still don't know when we recorded it, you know? Um, we won't tell them it's Wednesday. Exactly. No, we won't tell them that it's Wednesday, we January 31st. Oh, <laughs> at 547 yeah. PM. What? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Who said that? What? <laughs> Hello? All right. I hope you guys have a lovely rest of your time and thank you for tuning in to me talking with my very special guest. Bye. Thank you again for having me. Thank bye you. guys. Bye. Bye. bye.